You're listening to the Play It Brave podcast. Join Darcy for a wild rummage around in her wit and wisdom. She's a photographer, an educator, and a marketing ninja. Each week, she's going to be teaching you all about creating a life full of mindset, money, and marketing miracles. Listen to real world experiences and surefire strategies from expert guests, all to keep you focused on your path to success. Think less hand holding or fist bumps. So stop playing safe. It's time to start playing it brave. Here's your host, Darcy Benincosa. Welcome to the Play It Brave podcast. On this episode, I have my dear friend, Carrie Mo, founder, president of Type A Society, one of the most deliciously talented, creative beings I've had the privilege to work with. <laughs> Carrie wow. came with me to Scotland, I think in 2017 or 2018. 18, I think. Yeah. 18. And we, she styled my big uh, workshop out there and it was beyond every expectation oh. I could have ever had. Oh, Carrie's okay. business type A has brought in large and small companies. She works with the top commercial brands like Amazon and eBay. That's right, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's not small. (laughs) And then she does small things like Darcy Benincosa's workshop, which I am very (laughs) grateful for. But with every single job, with every single industry, whether it be wedding or commercial, Carrie is a freaking genius. And I have brought her on the podcast today so we can talk about viral content, so we can talk about how our struggles can really bring the thing that's going to define our business. So Carrie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's truly an honor, Darcy. I've just like followed your work for so long. I remember when the Path Workshops launched and I was looking at your content like, who is this artist? This is incredible and just so delightful to be a friend of you now and to work with you. And it's truly a a delight to be here with everyone. Thank you for having me. Oh, such it's our, it's like, seriously, my pleasure. I followed you for just as long and thought, would this lady ever consider working with me? I'm gonna get, and I finally got brave enough to ask and you oh, so did. Sweet. I dangled Scotland in front of you and you accepted. So and I just love you very much. Friend. We had the best time at the workshop and we had the best time after the workshop yes. and just a million amazing memories. So Carrie, I want to start a little bit with your history. Um, a question that I get asked a lot is how do I make a move from a, from a city or state mm-hmm. where I'm already well known and make sure my business doesn't fail, die, you know, people don't know who I am when I'm moving to a new place. And I know with your creation of type A, it went through a little evolution where you did change locations mm-hmm. and were met with some struggles. Do you want to fill us in a little bit? <laughs> yeah. So I had, I started my career in 2009 officially. I had had four years of experience working with a high-end wedding planner in DC. So we did all the wonderful weddings, the Ritz Carlton for season. And I've learned the luxury brand with wedding planning and what it takes. And it takes a lot and it's wonderful, but it's a very strategic bullet point you hit every day, right? For a luxury brand. And um, being in a city is wonderful for that kind of brand, right? So um, that was kind of what I was coached in and rehearsed in. And uh, in 2010, I started my job and it was called Flourish Events. It was a little wedding um, high luxury business. And I had a, opened a studio with a photographer and we were splitting rent and it was a big deal. Mm. And in that success marker, I had started to get like, oh, a few blogs. And then I got one magazine. So not that publication is the end all be all, but it definitely shows you that you're on the right track. Yes. Um, I was in an interview with a newspaper journalist and they were kind of asking how we had become such a success in just one year. And um, we were there explaining our story and we we're so excited. And in that interview process, I got a phone call that changed my life. Ooh, and I love these phone calls. Oh gosh, it was not a very good phone call. <laughs> okay, all right. no. I still love it. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a good phone call in the fact that it forced me and it put the pressure upon me to really choose who I was and what mm-hmm. I wanted in my life. So I think sometimes in life we can coast and, and, and do what is next and what is best that we think. But then we all know we've always we all have been hit with something where life goes through a curveball and it is like a slap in your face or a gut punch. Mm -hmm. And it forces you to be in a confined space and choose the first priority, the next best thing. It's like life or death. Um, And so I think that is the birthplace of true creativity and your best success moment when you really lean into your why, really 
go where it's painful and you live through that vulnerability and you choose in your core what is best for you, for your family or for your future, for your relationships, what you want, you're envisioning your future, right? Even if it looks like it's going to be like career suicide in a sense. So I did, I, choose to, I chose to move away from the median income in DC is like 125,000. I was in Northern Virginia, so it's like one of the top growing counties in the nation at that point. And I chose to come to the middle of California, which is still California, which is lovely, but the nowhereville of California. No one wants to live here. Yeah. <laughs> My town is called a gateway town. So it is like, oh, you want to pass through us and get gas and snacks, but don't stay here. Go to Yosemite because this is my town. It's just a stop along the highway. And um, I chose to, the medium income at that time was 25,000. So to be a luxury brand in the middle of a medium income city that has been just hit by the 2008 crash was really career suicide. And um, <laughs> I did it. And did you do it for your family, for your why? Was your why to be more present? What was your why? What yeah. Did, well, at the time it was my mom to? and it still is. So my dad okay. had, you know, he's, he graduated and, um, and it was my mom. So she is a widower and my dad had done so much for me in the past. And I, I couldn't imagine him ever having peace with knowing my mom was by herself. And at the time, all those, the sisters that I have, all of my siblings, they were in DC at the moment. And so the nat the natural person to move back into this area was, was me as I married a fellow Californian and it just was the natural next thing. Mm -hmm. And so he was in a career transition. It was perfect. And it was just now up to me to decide, could I do this? Could I really get that luxury brand and do it from the middle of nowhere in a very rural location uh, with nobody in this industry, in this town. Oh, yeah. no <laughs> so connection. how could I do that? And um, so if you're in a rural location, if you're faced with a life decision like that, if you feel like it is kind of a, an a ending of your whole being at this moment, let me just encourage you, friend, like it's not, it is a new opportunity. Yeah. One that actually might be the best for you and your future. And it is not going to look like what you're going to expect it to look like. And it's going to be so hard, but it can be, and if you believe it to be, will be better for you. So I, I agree so much. I feel like a lot of people, I would say most of humanity, because it's kind of ingrained in us, we resist so much anything we don't know. We mm -hmm. resist so much what we perceive as being change or mm -hmm. detrimental or different from the plan that we had in our minds. We resist it. And, you know, sometimes I just think running head into your biggest resistance is actually the place you just need to go. Like stop resisting. You're wasting so much time resisting. Yeah. Like if you have to move, if you have to restructure, if you've decided you don't even want to do weddings anymore, which mm -hmm. is happening more and more. A lot of photographers are coming to me and they're like, I don't want to fight the wedding fight anymore. It's a big fight. Like yeah. it's a, it's an intense, <laughs> it's uh -huh. an intense industry. So mm -hmm. Instead of just resisting, resisting, thinking everything's going to fall apart and maybe everything will fall apart. Did yeah. everything fall apart when you moved or did you yeah. just like- No, it did for a year. It did year and a half. So I did let it fall apart, but I, I think I love Brene Brown's um, Live the Wholehearted. Mm. If you want to watch her TED talk, I highly recommend that. So it's called um, Vulnerability, you know, a talk on vulnerability and she's like me, you know, she goes- into vulnerability with her <laughs> measuring stick. I'm a perfectionist and um, what underpins uh, living wholeheartedly is being vulnerable, authentic. And I like to be in the perfectionist side where I struggle with vulnerability so much. So I like to make things perfect. And that under that undoes connectivity, like connection, mm -hmm. because it's not perfect, right? <laughs> we have someone who passes away in our life and it causes this earthquake of an effect. We have issues. We, we are people, we're humanity. And we have things that we go through that, that will affect our business. And mm -hmm. to just say that we're only business and not personal and that they will never ever connect to each other, it's not true. We have relationships, we have families, we have things we also need to live through and in while we also uh, reach our next level in our career. And it's possible to do both. Very yeah. well in a rural location. I'm, I'm, I'm a firm believer that, but it takes letting go of that perfectionism and that desire for your own way or what it needs to be like, because it can have the potential to be much better if we know 
you know, how yeah. to let go. So perfectionism is tough. I oh. think it took me <laughs> 38 oh. years to let go of it. <laughs> oh, I'm like slowly, <laughs> I'm like having to go through this by trial and by fire, but I'm slowly getting there. <laughs> so what were some of the things that you decided to do in this rural area to get yourself so well known as you are today? Yeah. Well, I took a year and a half off. I actually quit. I decided mm-hmm. I was probably never going to go back. It was too impossible. It felt too insurmountable. Mm-hmm. And I went into my life. And my first thing is to live into your way, to know that the center of your being, why do you get out of bed? What is the reason you even started your career in the first place? Who are you at the end? What do you want to be at 80? You know, we, we all know these um, exercises, but we can never, ever deviate from them because they're true and they keep us stable, right? So mm-hmm. knowing your life. And so I followed that rule with my mom, believing that my first priority was to be with there for my family and to, to be there in a way that really was sacrificial, like, oh my gosh, I'm going to let go of this my career. And then I decided I would not probably not go back because it was just going to be too hard. And, and then I decided when I had my newborn, mm. <laughs> I needed to go back. I needed to go back. I needed to prove something to myself. Um, I needed to prove it even if it wasn't, nobody noticed, but I needed to know to myself that I had the ability to do this. Mm-hmm. And that it was possible. And so I was very strategic and I wrote down what I wanted to be and how I envisioned my future. And anything that didn't fall within that vision was a no. Um, yeah. So I, I made a very clear, good boundary place for myself to be in, to say, okay, this is my goal. I'd love to be this. I believe I can be it. It's going to be hard. And I'll, I'll be having to say no. So I started with my why and I had very intentional yet clear yeses and, and no's. And I kept going back to my, my core why. So, um, and then I Those did are huge. marketing, a lot of marketing. Yeah. That, I think it's really huge to know what you're going to say no to. Like I was walking yesterday and I always get lots of good insights. Thank goodness I got a dog. It's helping me walk every day. <laughs> That's one of the I reasons know. I got him. I was like two walks, you know, a day. And yeah. I was walking and I was thinking, what are the things that I'm doing by default mm-hmm. actually should probably be saying no to. And one of the things that came up was that I, from the very beginning of my career, have these like families that I've done many sessions for. I only charge 450. I shoot them oh. on digital. I do them every fall. Yeah. I've been photographing these kids since they were born. And I thought yesterday, I'm like, you're going to, it's the year to say no to that. (laughs) Like it will free up about Mm -hmm. 60 hours of your life. That's amazing. You get to say no. And I was like, no, I'll never say no to that. Like, that's just something that I just do because I've always done it. Uh And it's just those little things that we don't realize take up every single ounce of our free time, you know, Mm -hmm. and that's why we don't have more time to just go sit in nature. Like I would rather 60 hours sitting in nature Mm -hmm. at this point in my life Mm -hmm. than 60 hours doing these mini sessions for 450. So, um, yeah, it's really about, and a lot of people think, okay, I'll say no to all this new stuff, but it's like, what are the things that you are on so default about that you're still saying yes to, you don't even realize you're saying yes because they're such a part of your life. Yeah. And how do you decide to end some of that? So yeah, yeah. I think that's so good that you were, you had to be really strategic yeah. because of yeah. the struggle of where you were living. So did you end up traveling a lot? Like, did, yeah. you, did you do certain times of the mm-hmm. year and really take those campaigns and make them worth it? Yeah. So what I did was it forced me in a place. The confineness is actually a blessing. I, I, I had to flip it on its head and see what it was, not what it was, isn't. So I had to change my perspective on it mm-hmm. and every day believe that. So it was like a mantra and saying, I'm getting better every day in every way. And when I decided to enter back into the marketplace, it was like a practice of saying, I'm going to see what I have here. So it was a focus on gratefulness. And we all know that gratitude is like the highest vibration possible. And Mm -hmm. it opens up the the universe really to you. And so practicing that every day, I'm thankful for I am. I'm so thankful for what I've chosen. This is my blessing. This is what can make me better. Mm -hmm. And I chose to see the possibilities that I had. So in that fact that it was the things it was, is I no longer had a referral source. People weren't just saying, here's Carrie. She's there for you. Take the job. So I could only say, right? Yes, it's a nose to the things that came my way very cleanly because they're not coming all the time. 
um, then it would me, force me to reprioritize my friend group. So it said, all my friends, they're not asking me for the girls drinking party fun. Yay, hang out. Like, let's go to the fun, connective, like, oh, we're going to go to that fun party and all the people are there in the industry. So I didn't have that anymore. So I could choose now when the invitation came, whether I could or not. And then um, it also gave me the opportunity to travel. So I wanted to be a destination, you know, producer and work with big national brands and work with wedding commercial brands that could do beautiful work in France and, and in Italy. And so um, when the opportunity would come, it gave me the opportunity to say, okay, yes, this one maybe is more of a priority here for, for me. And this one I can say no to because um, in the end, this is what I desire. So very clear. Yeah. Yes, otherwise. And then also the marketing piece. So um, in 2012, I worked with, one, I did one thing. <laughs> I had tax returns. I didn't have very much money. So I had a newborn baby in 2012. And I put in all my tax savings to one editorial. And I think you did this thing, Darcy. You had one that you still use that speaks yeah. to your brand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was huge. Just phenomenal. That's the piece, the foundational piece. So you do an editorial or something that speaks to your brand that is still always what it will be. It's a timeless piece. And then you market the shit out of it. Excuse my French, but it's true. <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah, and you do. And you build upon that story. And you tell the world, this is me and this is who I am. Even just tell yourself. It, isn't, it doesn't even matter if it doesn't get published. You told yourself who you were in a beautiful yeah. way that spoke to you and menaced, like gave to people. So it, uh, so it was kind of a viral campaign in a sense that really attracted people's attention because it was everything I wanted to be and who I am still. And then I uh, marketed that. So I used it in all my, you know, branding, all of my sessions, um, my, my funnels and all the things to just really promote blogging and all, all the things. So, yeah. And then that's yeah. how we did it. We just built upon that brand. So that was just two things I did in 2012. I mean, imagine if you want to enter back in the marketplace, but you only have time to do two things, you know, I'm not just time, but you only have the money to do two things. And I knew that if I just did two things well, in that year and focused on that shoot and was being a newborn mom, I knew I was going to be okay. And then 2013, I decided um, that I was going to go from that branding session to just to one more thing. And that was an editorial with a wonderful photographer and then my own branding session. So excuse me, the editorial with wonderful photographer came first, then my own personal branding session. And then in 2014 is when I launched um, my business. And then in 2015, by the end of 2015, we had been asked to go to Nepal and New Zealand and oh France, um, and we were getting paid client editorial and production work. So it worked. <laughs> <laughs> Long story short, it worked. Works. Well, I have so many questions as you've been talking about all of this of... Um, you know, I, it was very clear to me when I asked you to come to Scotland, you were very clear about your why you were very clear about the dates you could be gone, what it would take to get you over there, how to make it worth it to you. One thing I've always admired about you is how clear you are on what you're worth and how you won't do things for free. And you're like, if I'm going to leave my babies, it better be worth it. And <laughs> all of that stuff. And yeah, there is power. One of the biggest mistakes I see young photographers make is one, they don't invest enough money in their styled shoots uh, to make a big enough impact. So they mm -hmm. just do the lowest amount possible. They don't want to invest in the models. And I think there's a time when you should do that. I don't know if you should do that your first two or three years as a right. photographer, to be honest, right. because I don't think you understand what luxury is then. Oh, you yeah. think you do. Yeah. I know this I'm speaking <laughs> from experience. Looking at some of my first work, I was like, yeah, this kind of makeup or this kind of dress or this kind of thing was totally luxury. And now I'm like, oh no, <laughs> no, now I, and, and I'm still learning. And I, I look at it all the time because people ask me all the time, how do you break into the luxury market? And it's like, well, one, you have to understand what it looks like. Mm -hmm. You can't tell that your portfolio doesn't look high end. I, that's the first place you have to start. Yeah. You have to be able to look at an image, look at a portfolio, look at what you're creating, look at the model you've chosen, the dress, the location, all of it, <clears throat> and see if it is quote unquote high end. And uh, yeah, I just, Found, I was deleting some old Facebook um, uh, albums from 2013 and I just saw this like 
I took the bridles <laughs> of my friend in this heavy digital, and she had these like tight little round bouquet of red roses and this yeah. like stiff satin dress and pearls on her veil. You know, God bless all of us oh, at that yeah. time. Like that's just where we were at. But it's like uh, I took this photo of her shoes, which were like clunky heels on this like pavement with the cracks in it. I'm like, what? I couldn't even find a good place we to put. All started like, there. We all did. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah, totally did. I know. I was looking through. Well, some how do you work. feel like you really trained your eye? I know this is veering off a little bit, but we're gonna go into viral content, and I actually think this is a really important piece because your portfolio, your brand on on Instagram, it's just impeccable. You just right. have this impeccable eye. I know you're Type A. I know it comes from perfectionism. <laughs> and I hear you. I'm the same. Uh, Perfection. Yes. I always tell people my perfectionism and OCD found a, a good outlet. Yes. <laughs> this is a great <laughs> outlet. Everything is perfect here. Um, yes. How do you feel like you developed it? Is it the same as me, where you just kept looking and looking and comparing your work to other people's and realizing the differences, like having that self-awareness or yes, you feel I like you so. got it. Yeah. I think it is experience, but it is also fine attention to detail. Yes, it is. And there, everything needs to have a purpose and a place and knowing why they work together the ways that they do and not to have anything within that frame that doesn't have a place, mm-hmm. doesn't speak some sort of value. And the values, what you're representing, knowing what that is in an image. So you can have a very high-end image that's super colorful and very avant-garde and totally not this fine art Italian feel that we feel like is the fine art. You can have very high-end clientele within the color world and the bold world and the modern world and every single opportunity there is for you to have a high-end luxury client, it's truly there Mm -hmm. in every single form of art, but you need to know what's the purpose and what your brand is. And if you're hitting that for that person, because there are specific conversations with it in each one of those people, they're all different. Mm -hmm. And so focusing on the detail, focusing on who that person is and why they would value that and knowing why, and being able to implement that in your visuals and in your, in your brand. And do you mean like why they would value these shoes or why they would value this ring or why they would value this dress or is it? Yes. So like, okay, let's take some examples. So we're talking Fendi. Okay. So Fendi is a very luxury brand in a sense. They pay a lot. You pay a lot of money. Dolce Gabbana. It's like, okay, you look at the rack at Nordstrom. This is $2,000. Fendi, this is 3000. So they're the comparing, right? Mm -hmm. You're still going to pay about the same amount but they're speaking to totally, totally two different people. Effendi is like a more of aggressive, bold person that is going to be like um, into the New York fashion, moving shaker. She is yeah. going to affect the world. She's like a visionary. Lakes her days, short skirt. Yeah, yeah. So even the brand itself is more bold and like guttural, like just more aggressive, but, it, mm-hmm. but it's still very much high end in a sense. It is going to be a bride in the end who's going to go towards that brand that's still going to spend a lot of money on a very modern, edgy wedding. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to look at the more romantic kind of brands, okay, like Monique Lulier or Oscar de la Renta, or you're going to have some of the Dolce Cabana floral or Gucci. Mm -hmm. You know, so each one is speaking to a different person, even the Kate Spade bride who's like, you're you're full and colorful, just all go out, you know, going full force for that. I'm here. I'm bold. Look at my color. Mm -hmm. Again, there's just different conversations within each of them. So studying what is a luxury brand, so many different things and knowing why somebody is going to put a lot of money on that. Cause it's again, so there's, there's four things that, that I I've learned in my mind. Yeah, let's dive into <laughs> yeah. let's dive into like the four things that really go with creating some viral content. And, and I think that people need to know your content is the, the foundation it's of everything <laughs> because you can then market it. But I always say like, people are like, I, I'm marketing and it's not working. And I just think it's bad content. Like if you're putting bad stuff out there, no matter how good your Facebook ads are, no matter how good your publications are or whatever, you're probably not getting the right publications. It's the content, the things that you're creating, mm-hmm. whether it's collaboration with a photographer, whether it's a product, whether it's your own photos, whatever you're creating is the foundation 
of what you have to market. So let's talk about creating that foundation. Let's talk about those four pillars. Yeah. Good content. Yeah. It's king. Content is king. So it's going to focus on connection and you're going to focus on the connectivity piece. So what makes the content viral? What makes the content hit the enter button? Yes. I'm going to buy this. I will spend 15,000, I will spend 10, or I'm going to spend your wedding photographer and you want to book 25,000. You want a wedding photographer, you want to book, I don't know, 80,000. What, what is your profit? You're going to know, okay, this is how much I need them to spend on me. Mm-hmm. And this is how I will connect with them to tell them that that is the value and it is worth it for them to spend 80,000 on me. It is worth it for them to spend 15, whatever you're going to mm-hmm. put your price on yourself and your, your, your abilities. And you're going to say, I'm going to connect with you in a way that's $80,000 worth of value to you. I'm going to connect with you in a way that's 15, whatever your price point is for your services or for your brand or whatever you're offering to the world. So it's going to be a connection that is so valuable that it will be easy in a sense for them. I mean, still, it's going to take a swallow, but they're going to say, yes, that fills 80,000 to me or 15 Mm -hmm. or whatever. And so there is a piece that you have to close the gap between saying, this is the price And this is what I'm going to give you. And you have to believe me that I'm going to give you that in connection, in Mm -hmm. experience, in value, in in that, and and speak to their heart in that connection piece. So a viral, whether it's a video, whether it's a logo, whether it's, I mean, we can take, dissect different brands like Apple and Harley Davidson and, you know, Nike, I mean, these Google, like these brands have connected to the core, right? So these are not wedding brands, but when you enter into them, you know, you're getting, a fa- you have the, their why is being spoken. It's the yeah. deep emotional connection you have to them. You feel intellectual when you buy Apple products, you have Harley Davidson, they gave masculinity to a man, right? Mm-hmm. And then you have like Nike, which is like power and I can do it. And then you've got like Google, which is the most user-friendly, like Chelsea said, and it's so true. It's the simplest. So again, they're, they're focusing on connection. What can you give to man and how can you present that why first and foremost and close that gap between what you're asking and what they're going to easily do. They need, you need to lead them into that place. So it's not about you. It's not about your brand story. Mm -hmm. It's about them. And it's Mm -hmm. about how you can connect to them in such an emotionally powerful way that it's like a simple yes. As a photographer, I always think, how can I create the images that they will want to put on their Pinterest board? Yes. Yes. (laughs) My bride, I want to be all over their Pinterest board because that's who they're going to hire is the person who's creating what they want. So I, I spend a lot of time thinking if I were planning a luxury destination wedding here, what kind of images would I be pinning? Mm -hmm. And do I have enough of that kind of image in my portfolio to, to make sure that they're they're pinning me. Yeah. I want to make sure that's why I do Pinterest so much and look at who's pinning me and, and all of that stuff and see if I'm getting it out there. So yeah, Yeah. I think that's really, really smart how to add the value. And I've had times where I've been like, Oh, I'm doing all my personal work. I'm going to charge this much, but I didn't sit down enough and think about, well, what is the energetic exchange there? Yes. Because I think right now we're in the space of self-love and I agree with it. I'm saying it silly, but I agree like self-love, self-worth, charge more, blah, blah, blah. And I get it. But I also think there's so much um, snake oil out there where people are like just charging a number without actually giving the value <laughs> what they're, they're offering. And I have a big radar for that where I'm like, that is just her needing to prove to herself that she's worth this price, but she hasn't proven that to me by anything she's given. I think your free content out there should be worth thousands of dollars. And that's what I've tried to do. So yeah, I think there's, um, this, what you're bringing up is so important to sit down and think, what is the energetic value exchange of why I would ask for this price? And the the Um, energy and the connection, like I said, has to be that luxury I am giving to you this price point it, yeah. is they feel it. Yeah. So that starts with connection. Yeah. It's so true. And the next thing is it starts with why. So I love Simon Sinek and that's how I started my, my whole job and career in high base society, which in one year was like, boom, versus all the things I had done and all the experience and luxury brand and all the stuff I was around luxury, but I never fully understood it. Um, that would start with why. And then he said, and it's true, your limbic brain, the, the, the Neanderthal part of your brain, the gut, 
the instinct, the things that you know doesn't make sense, but it makes sense because <laughs> it's your gut, your intuition. And that is what you lead with as people. And you can have all the yeses in front of you. You can say, this is good for you. This is right for you. You should do this. This is this, this is blah, blah, blah. And if it doesn't feel right to the person, it won't, it won't. Mm -hmm. So it's an emotional gut why that they, you have to start with first. So again, we kind of already focused them on that with connection, but that was number two. And then the three was, it tells a story that's true again. And that was what Chelsea was saying. And it's so true is that you're, you're, what they say about you is what you are, not necessarily what you're telling the world and to closing yeah. that gap of being and authentic. She's, she's referring to Dr. Chelsea Shields, who yeah. did a podcast a couple of weeks ago that says your brand is not what you say it is. It's what people say it is when you're not in the room. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Can you go into depth a little bit of, of how you have done that? Yeah. Okay. So, um, for me in my brand story, I knew that the truth was I wasn't in a luxury place and I didn't have Paris or New York. And so to be in a luxury market and to still get luxury production work, um, I needed to, to be honest that that wasn't me at this point, but I had the qualities and the capabilities to do that. So mm -hmm. what I had to do first was show that I had that. And so it would just took a lot of experience again, of putting editorials out there that were that quality of experience yeah. to show the world that I could do it. And it was telling a true story. It was saying, I'm in the middle of nowhere. I am a very creative artist. I have the ability to do this. See, and I want to connect with you and encourage you you can do the same. And that is what was true. And that is still is true. And that is how, you know, we have been working with Zappos and we work with the, the brand for the Ritz Carlton and the Marriott. Um, and we have Berta Bridal, Berta Bridal flew us out to New York to do their runway show. So um, Claire Pettibone has hired us as well. Trumpet and Horn, Mrs. Box, you know, Plum Pretty Sugar. So, so they did that and flew me places because I was telling that true story. Mm -hmm. So here's another one I, I worked with. Okay. So for Zappos, they have a massive budget. I mean, you're going to have no problem with producing what you want to be able to do and connect to their audience because they have the budget okay. for it. But anyway, <laughs> so, so again, it's just telling the true story of their, their women that buy from the company. Mostly it's about shoes. It's about fun. And, and, you know, they don't, uh, they, they basically give you like, you get all the shoes you want. If you don't like them, you can send them back. Okay. Yeah. And we'll even pay for the shipping there and back. It's user friendly. We're all about this experience for the, for the person who's, who's buying our shoes. I love Zappos, but that's the same thing in marketing for them. So I'm not going to create and produce work for them. That is not true to that story. So it's mm -hmm. simplified shots. We're going to be focusing on shoes, focusing on women, empowering. We brought in influencers, women who are already watching them on Instagram, that loving them, that is in the image. That's more powerful than a model. Let's not go to models. They're not very perfect. They're too perfect. We're just for yes. that. focusing on connection. So you bring in real life influencers and you bring in people who are already moms and you're going to just, in, you know, scatter those images in the Instagram from the campaign, but along with everyday Instagram people that are just saying, Hey, here are my shoes. So that's kind of how Zappos does it. So they have the marketing producer and help, you know, person that visually will create the image for them, but they're not going to lead with my images on their Instagram all the time because they're still too perfect. Yes. They're going to, they're going to have connection. They're going to have people in there that are real life people. So again, knowing that story, they still have massive brands. We do wonderful work, but again, knowing their full content needs to be connection. So that's, that's, that. and that's how I've always felt with like when somebody does a styled shoe and I have been guilty of this. And then there's like a table set in a, in a, in like a random place, like on a beach right. by the water under a rock. I'm like, is this true to this true? a wedding story? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, are we really yeah. <laughs> putting a table here? Like, is this really what's going to happen? Right. Right. Um, so once I saw that, like little things where I'm like, okay, this woman is like dashing into the ocean and she's in this <laughs> gown and like, that's more for the artist. Yeah. Like those shots, these kind of well, styled shoots. I'm like, that's ride. just for you <laughs> really? to be all emotion and dramatic, <laughs> but is it true to what your clients story. want? Yeah. yeah. So and a lot of people don't think about that. They don't. Yeah. So that was my story. And just telling that my first visual was from my California location with my team, my own brand story, which was, I'm an artist. I can produce this work. Here's my work. Let me connect with you. And mm -hmm. how can I help you get there? And then that was Zappos saying, we're going to produce 
shoe-based quality work that's influencer-based and we need you to help us get there. And I produce that work for them. Now I'm worked, I just worked with a wonderful um, photographer I love dearly. She's become a dear friend. And her goal was very specific. She wanted a high-end bride, like of course we all do. And mm -hmm. she wants them to do a five-digit package. So beginning mm -hmm. at 10,000 above, mm -hmm. um, she would love it to be 15. And she wants it to be destination. So France, a five-star resort bride. Um, and so there was a series of editorials we did for her. We went to Amman Resort and we put on this beautiful editorial. We pulled in my friend Daniel from Geraldine Magazine and he mm. did some incredible dress pulls. He's awesome. Hall. Yeah, he's amazing. Incredible artist. And, um, and so we, we brought that for her and we did that, produced that for her. And then we went to France and we produced three for her. One was fashion oriented, one was wedding, and that was in one place. And then we went to another location and pulled in a local planner because again, it's not just to build myself back into their brand. If you, you have to know what really is going to serve people. I'm a producer. I create images for people. I bring mm -hmm. it all together, but also she is needing a luxury client, a bride specifically, and that will help her through planning too, connecting her with planners. So bringing in a planner and pulling the wardrobe for her in that, in that instance. Now, she put them through her sales funnel. She marketed out. She dripped them on her Instagram feed. She put them on a few, few, few blog posts. They haven't even been published, not even in a magazine yet, not even on a blog. And she booked two destination brides, awesome. one in Hawaii and then one in France with five digit packages. Yay. It works, right? It. So it took a year of intentional mm -hmm. hitting the bullet mark every single time we work together mm -hmm. and knowing exactly what we were doing and why we were doing it and why we picked this model and this gown and speaking to every single point for that client. Every time I made something for this photographer and, and for Zappos or any client, what is the end goal for that? It has to speak to their client. It mm -hmm. has to emotionally connect in a way. So there's all, you know, analytics and intentionality and strategy. So, so it tells, so the third point there was it tells a, a story that. that's true. That's why I think okay. having a partnership or a team is <laughs> very helpful because yes. sometimes doing this as one person as you can really get lost yeah. in all the details. Yeah. And I would say that's the time to invest in something like that is probably when you've gotten the $2,000, $3,000 weddings done. You've done yeah. it for a couple of years. You know how to shoot weddings yes. at the place where you're like, okay, now is the time for a massive up level. When you know so who you're really you know, admire. Getting brand awareness of yourself. When you know who how to use I? your camera. Who, who, yes. How to use your camera. You know how to light a reception because you don't <laughs> yes. want to book a $15,000 wedding no. if you're still like iffy on how to light yes. a reception. You need to know yeah. how to do what you're doing before you can really grant. I really don't even think that. I knew how to use my flash the first three years I was in this. Can I admit that? <laughs> I know. She I would always hire a second shooter yeah. who knew because yeah. I was a, I was a film photographer. I'm like, how do I get this thing to work? Luckily exactly. I had a friend who was a master at it know. and she would just set my flash up for me. She's like, do it like this. Darcy. I'm like, oh, thank goodness you're here because I don't know. Now I know and I need to know because I'm booking those really expensive. Yeah. Ones. So, okay. So number four was focus on connection. I mean, number one was focus on connection. Number two was start with why. Number three was tell a story that is true. And number four is. It solves a problem. Solves yeah. A problem. It solves a problem. So it's going to solve a problem for the person that's hiring me or, or, or the person that's going to buy from them. So mm -hmm. again, if, what are you doing? So let's say you don't have me and I'm not, we're not producing this and you're trying to do it on your own. Again, so you're going to have to focus very clearly on your marketing budget for the year and how much you can put in. And I say shoot less and shoot quality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you can only do one thing in your year, but put a lot of good energy into it and focus and a good budget, that will go so much further than doing free work for friends that, like you said, and yeah. that will just be like in the beach, like with a bouquet. So um, it solves the problem and you need to understand what problem you're solving in those images. Mm -hmm. And who that person is going to be that's going to read that look, that wonderful, beautiful bride against a blue backdrop on a French chateau with this gorgeous headpiece, with this Galahov gown, with this diamond ring that's worth more than the down payment on two houses that I purchased and sold. But anyway, <laughs> like you need to know what that's saying to that person. And that person who saw that image knew it. And she bought that five digit package from that person. So it solves a problem. It solved that person who saw the image problem of saying, I need a wedding photographer. 
-hmm. And I see this image and that makes sense to me that she's the one to do it because look at this quality of work that she's just created. So um, how can you solve people's problems? That's what we are as entrepreneurs. We're here to solve people's problems. We also are to solve our own problems too. I mean, we have a lot of internal work, right? So this self awareness movement is so good and so true. And it and also needs to be, like you said, just right up against how can I serve? So how can I be filled and know what it's like to know healing and to know peace and to be vulnerable and to live in my vulnerability and live through life and not numb the feelings of pain because that's part of the joy and not like close off all pain of, of, of being attacked and, and trying to hide from being known, but being open, being open hearted and leaning hard into that, even when it makes us want to scream and run away. And through that, knowing that joy is beyond that to be able to solve really people's problems. The better we are with managing our own uh, lives and learning mm-hmm. how to work through those things helps us internalize, you know, be healthier as individuals, but also yeah. help, help, helping people. So. Well, I think yeah. also, once you niche down and you know your ideal client and you're shooting for them, you're not going to appeal to everybody at all. And you have to allow people to unfollow you. You have to allow people to not resonate with you. You know, I remember when the big adventure elopements came around and everyone was on like a cliffside and the wind was blowing and these people looked like little beautiful hipsters and they were all under 25 and they were all giving each other piggyback rides. And I just thought, hell no, I don't want to do any of that. And everybody was growing and massive. Like these young 20 year old photographers were just getting like a hundred, 200,000 followers on Instagram. And I just thought, nope, I'm still marketing to the lawyers and doctors who are awkward, who would never give anybody a piggyback ride. (laughs) who are in New York, who want somebody who understands New York, who understands the luxury of New York, who Mm -hmm. knows how to get into a rooftop restaurant there, who, who isn't just all like about the selfies. Like they don't care about that. Like so many of my clients are not even on social media. In fact, I shot a wedding in Singapore a couple of years ago and she was like, I don't want any of these shown. And I Mm -hmm. I was heartbroken because it was at one of the most expensive venues in Singapore, already an expensive place. And you know, I actually reached out to her two days ago because I was updating my website and I just said, could I please use these five images where you're just turned away because they are my ideal client. And I didn't want to show their faces, but I wanted to show her luxury gown. I wanted to show this amazing hotel. I wanted to show their beautiful, she's very statuesque and gorgeous. And um, I just wanted to show that, you yeah. know, and, and luckily she said, yes. So I get oh, good. some of those photos, they, it, it's been haunting me. I have so many weddings and I don't I can't share, but um, oh, man. yeah, just really knowing who you're going after. It's okay. If you're not the trend, it's okay. Mm-hmm. If you know your client, it's okay. If you create cl- content that speaks to that client mm-hmm. and your own personal growth, like you were saying so beautifully is a result of what your business looks like. I truly believe that when we run our own businesses, they reflect what we're doing in our personal lives in a lot of ways. If we're always exhausted, if we're always overworking, if we're always um, saying yes to everything, if we're staying up all night editing, if we're doing whatever it is, always responding to emails, being there for everybody, our business is going to be tapped out. We're going to be burned out. We're going to never feel like we get paid enough money. You know, I think we all have to go through at least two years of that before think, we finally yeah, realize. I, I so. feel like everybody I know goes through that. It's just like a learning curve. Like, why did I go through that? I know. Can I, could I have shortened that time? No, not this. Nope. I got to have to learn it the hard way. Yeah. The th- question I've been asking myself every morning, because sometimes I do overdo it with creating content. I'm always like podcast and let me do this freebie and let me do this masterclass. And, yeah. and today I was like, how can I just make this easier? Like, how do I not always have to be creating every single week? You know, how can yeah. I take one or two really quality pieces and put those out there instead of like 10 pieces, you know, right, I right. we all get to figure that out. And that's the biggest gift in being an entrepreneur is you can, it's your, you're doing it for freedom of life. You're doing yeah. it because you can. Yeah. And you should have the freedom to be able to say yes and no. And not that you're going to like take everybody off by saying no all the time, 
because you're, you do want to say yes. And that's why you're in business. You want to say yes. And that's not what I'm saying is like, you should be a no, no. But I think knowing the intentionality behind each yes and no, and having the reason for your no's and standing by those and not feeling bad by that. And then knowing your value and what you're bringing to the table and having confidence in that. And if you don't feel confident in your value, you know, if you don't feel confident that you should charge this price, then don't charge that price until you, I mean, again, you're going to not always feel confident before you charge that price. You're going to have to just jump in that fear. I'm saying it's okay to do internal work and seek the healing and seek the help that you need to feel peace in your own self. And I think, um, you're not going to always be ready when you're going to charge that $15,000 price or 10 or whatever your price point is going to be in your next level, but you do need to do it sooner than you're comfortable with. Yes. But you also need to be comfortable with you, you. Mm-hmm. And if you're not comfortable with you and you continue down the years, five, 10 years, and you're still not comfortable with who you are, um, it's okay to seek that help and say, you know, I need to build confidence. Why am I having a pricing issue? Why am I not valuing myself? Yes. Ah, so true. Oh man. And your value isn't in people, you know, saying, yeah, you're worth that price. You know, (laughs) your value is in knowing I'm worth this price Yeah, and I can do it. I see, I did it. (laughs) (laughs) You know what I mean? In that sense, you know, that's not, and not that that's just your only value. You, your value as a person, you give people meaning by your time being there just Mm -hmm. getting eye level with my child and listening really intentionally. I've given her so much value, like sitting with a friend and listening all the way and not trying to think about your next thing, but really connecting to them. That's so much value. You give people value in many different ways, not in just your pricing. Mm, It's so true. And that's why I loved what you were talking about with the value. Like if, if we're going to wrap this podcast up, but I think that's a perfect way to end is to sit and think about your value, your inner worth, Mm -hmm. what kind of exchange are you giving? What kind of knowledge? Mm -hmm. You know, I know some people look at my hourly rate and think, oh my gosh, who does she think she is? And I think I'm a person who's invested over a decade into understanding. (laughs) Lois Howell's mastermind. Boom. (laughs) Yeah. And I can give you a $10,000 idea in an hour. 10,000. Easy. At least 10. Yes. Probably 40. Yes. And so 1500 for an hour with me to get that if you really do it, um, I'm not saying it's going to be easy to make the 10 or 40. Yeah. You're going to have to build through it. But yeah, I think when we really understand how much our, our time is worth, how much education, how much we've studied, and really look at that and how we connect with people. Yeah. It's such a good um, discussion. And mm-hmm. viral content is so important mm-hmm. to getting seen. You and I both get published mm-hmm. a lot. We are mm-hmm. both very aware of how our brands are being perceived. Mm-hmm. We're very aware of every image that we post on Instagram. We're very aware of who we collaborate with and what mm-hmm. we say yes to. Mm-hmm. And um, that's what I think is really putting us in the in the president CEO seat of our businesses. <laughs> so we oh, yeah. make smart decisions. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. But, and you can do that too, friends. Like it's, it's, I'm just to encourage you. It might sound like a lofty goal, but literally I'm just to tell you, like I'm in the middle of Merced and I have a home little studio. I have two little kids. Like I just put myself together, put a little makeup on my face. Like we all put our pants on the same way. Yeah. And the difference is maybe between Darcy and, and where we've achieved or whatever and what you wanted to be. They're very small, but we have chosen to be intentional. We have chosen to value ourselves and we want to encourage you to do the same. Like yeah. value yourself, value your time. Oh, it's gold. You can never get it back. It's more valuable than money, yeah. your time and value your people in your lives, value saying no to this career or whatever and doing what is right. And in the end, it's going to come back your way. It's true. Look at the story of my life. So anyway. You can do this. Yeah. I want to encourage you, friends. If you feel stuck, if you feel overwhelmed, you can do this. And if we can do this, so can you. And you know, we've been at it for a decade too. I know so exactly. <laughs> it's like there's time, time with all of this. Time. Um, but everybody, go join the Play It Brave group in yes. Facebook because in there, like every week, I show a photo that I took at the beginning of my career. Yes, I love it. And I compare it with a photo that I take now. Yes. And everybody's like, "This is so uh, reassuring." Yes. <laughs> Because I was, anything that you guys oh, are experiencing, man. we were both there. Um, but I think and we I want to be clear on in our your, wise. Yeah. 
And I do, I want to be in your boot camp because I'm like, girl, I love marketing. And Ooh. I love, I'm like, there, I'm always learning. You have to always learn. I'm like, oh, I want to be in Darcy's boot camp. The boot camp, <laughs> I'll tell you what. Oh, I man, that looks so that. good, Darcy. It's it's 5,500 now, but I know it should be 10,500. Oh, totally. Like, I already know. I'm like, With when all am the I gonna, knowledge that you I'm probably going to put it up to 10 grand next year. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's totally, yeah. And who we have come in and speak and all the knowledge, the millions oh, of dollars that we've made just from being very clear on mm -hmm. um, your why, yes. very clear on a marketing plan, learning how to find and add mm -hmm. value, all of the stuff we're talking about today, which we can talk about. It, it really does require digging deep mm -hmm. and it requires self-knowledge and self-love and self-awareness. Yeah, so thank you so yeah, much. For I'm so glad to meet today. you today. Yeah. This is wonderful. That's I can't wait to see you at hybrid collective in a couple in like three days. Three days and yeah. um, I'm so grateful for you sharing your story and giving us an insight into your business. And um, it's obviously working because you have such an amazing portfolio of collaborations that just show how much you are able to bring value into everybody's life and you've brought value into our life today. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you've been listening to the Play It Brave podcast. Love what you heard? Wonderful. You can shout about it in the reviews. I bet you know someone who needs a shot of self-belief. Then don't keep us a secret. If you've missed something crucial, we've got show notes for this and all past episodes over at darcybenincosa.com forward slash play it brave. Thanks for tuning in. But don't forget, the world teaches you to play it safe. Stand up, stand out and start playing it brave.